Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am K.S. Narayan. I welcome you all on behalf of the IIT Alumni Center Bengaluru for the 60th uh, webinar. Uh, we have been conducting these webinars online since April 2020. Uh, this has been a really a successful series. And in case you have missed it, you can find our previous webinars on YouTube. Uh, we normally have these webinars on Saturdays live uh, twice a month, uh, typically at this time, five in the evening. Uh, I'm joined in here by uh, the, uh, Dr. Sushila Venkatraman of IIT ACB, uh, who has been the major driver for these uh, webinar series. And during this course of pandemic, uh, we also realized the importance of manufacturing, that towards scale and speed. Uh, so uh, this webinar today is going to be very relevant uh, considering that uh, in the last seven, eight years, uh, Industry 4.0 has uh, taken root across the world in advances in computing power and algorithm, algorithmic research has accelerated the process of adoption and productivity uh, gained from this concept. Uh, we have two experts today to tell us uh, a lot about it. Uh, the speaker today is uh, Sivramakrishnan Narayanan. Uh, he's a management professional with uh, 26 years of experience. Uh, in this area. Uh, he's uh, working with Bristol Cone, a Mahindra Group company, and his specialization is in manufacturing and supply chain management. So uh, he comes with a tremendous experience uh, with uh, many global players. He's uh, currently involved in solving some of the next generation manufacturing challenges for his clientele using technologies like machine learning, industrial automation, business analytics, etc. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer from Bangalore University and a uh, uh, postgraduate in management from IIM Calcutta. So moderating this talk today is uh, uh, Professor Amresh Chakraborty, a uh, very well-known figure, a senior professor and current chairman of uh, the Center for Product Design and Manufacturing at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, he's also an engineer uh, is an uh, IAC alumni with an ME and a PhD in engineering design from the University of Cambridge, uh, where he has led uh, the design synthesis group uh, for nearly a decade. Uh, so after uh, joining uh, IAC, uh, he's been uh, very actively involved and very well known for the design research methodology. Uh, he's uh, founded the Ideas Lab uh, India's first design observatory. He's also the editor of the artificial uh, uh, journal, uh, the artificial intelligence for engineering design analysis and manufacturing, AIE and DAM journal. Uh, I think it's a well-known journal in the field. Uh, so in fact, he's uh, written a chapter titled, What is Industry 4.0 for India? A recent uh, a chapter in a Springer series book. So we'll have an interesting uh, uh, view from an academia also uh, over this discussion. Okay. So with this uh, short introduction, uh, it's over to the speakers. And just before I hand it over to the speaker, I just want to let people know that if they can engage uh, uh, with the speakers using the Q&A box, not the chat box, uh, please put in your question over there and uh, Professor Chakraborty will be moderating. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Narayan and Dr. Sushila and Professor Amrish. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, pleasure to talk to you all about a subject uh, that I have indulged in quite extensively. Um, just one last uh, piece uh, that I probably missed out. Uh, I believe. Um, you know, as a management professional, as a working professional, you should, uh, you know, kind of get your hands dirty in, uh, in the subjects that you're interested in. Uh, so following that principle, I also acquired for myself a postgraduate uh, program, a certificate from Purdue University after working for a year uh, in the space of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I finished this um, in the year of 2021. So this uh, this field and the areas that I'm going to talk about 
uh, is so interesting and such a central part of what I do uh, that I thought uh, I'd be letting myself down and my clientele down if I don't have a better or more formal visibility of the topics at hand. Uh, so that's about me. And uh, like I said, I'm happy to be here. Um, and I will share my screen uh, so that we can start the day's proceedings. I hope you can all hear me clearly. If there is any problem, uh, please do type it up in the Q&A um, so that the moderators can just stop me and uh, we can rectify the problem for you. Can uh, hear you. OK. Let me share my screen. And if you can confirm that you can see it. Yes, all good. Okay, okay. wonderful. So um, what I'll do is, uh, I mean, it's a topic, um, you know, on the one hand, it is a passion. And as with uh, people that are passionate about any subject, uh, the rest of the world sometimes just gets uh, bored out of their skulls. So <laughs> what I've done, is to try and keep it um, in two levels, right? So one uh, is to try and see if we can cover the broad policy, the, the landscape uh, that we are talking about here in India. Um, what is the landscape of the industry for in general? Um, and then the second half of this day's uh, discussion will be more focused around uh, practical examples, examples that I have seen worked on myself um, in various engagements for various clients, uh, kind of without naming the names, uh, because this is going to be a public uh, accessible video, uh, try and provide you a flavor of what happens, right, and how typically clients go about doing the work uh, that they're doing. Um, and it's fascinating. It is fascinating. It is um, sometimes brilliant, sometimes extraordinarily creative, of course, extraordinarily frustrating for the people that are doing this uh, in the field, uh, because no uh, good work comes out of uh, simply luck. A lot of hard work goes into it. And uh, that is something that I wish to highlight uh, for those of you who are interested in this journey and, uh, you know, the end outcomes of this journey. Uh, so it's in two parts, one which is more policy and high level, another which is more examples um, and from the ground. Um, and, you know, any questions, any clarifications, any doubts anybody may have, uh, please feel free to post it up and I'm more than happy to take them along with Professor, Professor Amesh, Amresh, uh, my collaborator for the day. Let me get going. <laughs> So what is this all about, right? So industry four, why is it four? Why not four and a half? Why not six? Uh, so there is a lot of, obviously, a lot of excitement about it. Um, so I start I start with something that, you know, we see this almost in every technology that takes birth um, over the last 180, 100 years, right? Um, and this is a typical management person um, saying, you know, you don't even gossip, um, you know, and I'm getting more productivity uh, per uh, rupee of invested money. Uh, so when can I start, right? Everything is positive. So it's almost a silver bullet, right? And anything uh, that we have seen in the last several years, whether it is a simple payroll application in the middle of the century, last century, uh, or the ERP systems that we are all now very familiar with uh, in the last 25, 30 years, my career actually runs in parallel to the growth of ERP in India. And, uh, Everybody is uh, almost always saying uh, this will solve all the problems. So, in fact, I'll just stay here for a minute uh, just to summarize, uh, you know, another humorous episode. So, we were doing an ERP project for a very big company in the West, and uh, one of my colleagues was in the room uh, along with the CIO, and we were it was a little late in the day. Um, and uh, the expectations were running high from the client. And uh, my colleague says from behind his computer, once we go live, uh, if you post a wrong accounting entry, then a red light will glow in your room. Uh, so the CI was obviously taken aback. And uh, he said, how do you say that? How does, how does the CRP uh, tell me uh, or you know, warn me that a wrong accounting entry has been passed? So my friend gets up, goes to the switchboard and turns on a lamp and say, this is how, because I'll see the accounting entry is wrong in the system and I'll go and turn on a lamp. So many, many times, uh, the uh, the way that things are done may not be all automated and, uh, you know, very slick. 
uh, but end of at the end of the day uh, we from india we have this uh, mentality of getting things done uh, many times it is great many times it's not so uh, this one in particular the industry revolution 4 uh, offers us a chance to really become world beaters in manufacturing so we will talk about how this happens right so what is industry uh, revolution 4 and why 4 right so the first revolution was really driven by the construction of railways and the invention of the steam engine right so if you all remember your history lessons from school the cotton gin and the steam uh, james watt and the experiments that he did with the steam engine uh, that's where the whole industrial revolution starts uh, and this lasted between 1760 and 1840 right and this period of history was extraordinarily rich and productive in both scientific uh, thinking and uh, engineering um and this was the first industrial revolution where things moved from merely being handmade uh, to being more machine driven uh, more scalable and you know repeatable kind of work the second revolution started when ford started his model t factory right where he wanted to have a vast factory which owned everything from the forests of teak uh, to the final marketing of cars to the customers Uh, the assembly line the invention of electricity thomas edison uh, nikolai tesla great people that worked a lot in electricity and of course michael faraday right so in all of this uh, there was a lot of gain that people made uh, and today the modern assembly line is a symbol of uh, the industry of the manufacturing industry uh, to that extent so it's become a characteristic of the industry it was not so about a, about 100 years ago the third industrial revolution um, i'm sure a lot of us have lived through this uh, it really started when the first eniac computer which uh, you know occupied an entire block uh, and when it was turned on uh, the legend goes that the lights of philadelphia dimmed a little bit uh, it consumed that much power um, and from then to now when we carry a smartphone in our pocket uh which has the computing power equivalent to that machine that uh, that occupied an entire block uh i think uh, we have seen the growth of this where almost every department in every company that we go to uh use a small spreadsheet application or a very large and complex design application uh, yesterday in fact i was in a in a company that man manufactures uh, components for the aerospace industry uh, and the laser cutting machines that i saw there uh you know and this is here right here in bangalore um could have been in any advanced part of the world and the computer that was sitting on it was just as powerful as an eniac uh helping cut components for for the industry right so this uh came about because of improvements in solid state microelectronics um and you know almost uh, frenetic pace of adoption of computers in all aspects of work that we do today and what we are doing right now this presentation is just as well a child of the third industrial revolution that i'm able to talk to all of you on a video conference from home uh, clearly and sharing my screen and uh, you know also looking at um, the questions that you are posting so there is a collaboration that's happening which was simply not possible as recently as 8 to 10 years back now this brings us to the fourth industrial revolution uh which is now very interesting because very disparate very unconnected or previously unconnected aspects of business have started getting connected so suddenly we are seeing biology uh which was earlier limited to a pharmaceutical industry or a biotechnology industry uh people were specialized there uh, now it is thrown open and a lot of people um are engaging in aspects that we previously thought was inaccessible it is you know technology has democratized the possibility of engineers working in advanced biology applications nanotechnology for diagnostics uh, in patients is something we have all read about uh, and some of these are actually here in india right hospitals in india using nanotechnology to identify if there are cancers that they cannot otherwise access using standard imaging technologies um so a lot of these things uh, which are otherwise unheard of and what would have sounded uh, straight out of a book from science fiction is now available to us uh, who would have imagined uh, that you can actually print human tissue and we will talk about this in a little while uh, 
um, and the phenomenal work that is happening right here in Bangalore, right? And if you just go and type up uh, some of the phrases, and I was just doing a simple thought experiment in preparation for this uh, presentation. Uh, and I was typing things like Industry 4 in Bangalore, uh, 3D printing in Bangalore, you know, some experiments like this into a Google search bar. Uh, and within 0.35 seconds, 0.7 seconds, I got a million search hits, okay, for this kind of a very general, very casual search. Um, and I'm sure a lot of those uh, would be repeated or junk uh, or probably not in Bangalore. Uh, but suffice to say that a, uh, the first 8, 10, 20 links that Google threw back at me were all in Bangalore, right? And this is just Bangalore and the rest of India is still an untapped, um, unexplored potential. Um, a lot of these companies are bringing together space technology, biology, uh, engineering, physics, and of course, at the root of all uh, of it, mathematics, advanced mathematics. Uh, in ways that we have never imagined before. And today, uh, we are poised in a place where uh, we can actually turn this to our advantage. Uh, it is for us to figure out what we need to do, right? So this is why it is the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and we are looking at, standing here today, we are looking at a sustainable future. We are looking at how we can not damage uh, the one planet we know uh, beyond repair uh, for our future generations and how we can build on some of these technologies in ways that help us uh, get, you know, contain global warming, get back uh, into a more sustainable track of development. So what is it that takes us into Industry 4? Um, so the first and foremost is green energy, right? How do we harness the sources uh, that we have in abundance in nature, solar energy, wind energy, waves, uh, geothermal, magnetic, you name it. Um, how can we uh, generate this energy um, in carbon neutral ways and how can we distribute it, right? While electric cars are all the rage today, um, you know, the question really that hangs over the industry is, are they actually, when they finally are in the hands of the consumer, are they truly carbon neutral, right? So that's something uh, to think about. Of course, we've touched upon a little bit on computing power and mobile computing. Um, we have immense power in our fingertips. I mean, a little toddler today, uh, my own sons had more efficiency on an iPad uh, when they were three and four uh, than when I had with a laptop when I was 22, right? And that's how fast the new generation has taken to technology. And that's how fast technology has made itself understandable to people that don't even know how to read and write. Um, my own parents, um, of course, on the wrong side of uh, the retirement age, uh, are able to navigate through a complex payment application like Google Pay without any assistance from me. And that's impressive, right? Uh, how easy it is for people with no understanding of how payments technologies work to use a technology and to make it happen for themselves. And life is their life is better as a, as a consequence. Of course, the internet has revolutionized what we do today. Um, cloud computing, uh, more and more people want to rent um, computing space and computing power rather than buy. Things have changed dramatically. And those of you who've been uh, on Twitter in the last couple of days, um, OpenAI has released their chat GPT, right? And uh, it is incredible. It is incredible to see what people are um, typing up there, uh, it is chat GPT is basically a chat bot, uh, you know, but it is a lot more than chat bot. It is a, it is an incredible piece of work. You will not sitting on the other side of your computer, uh, understand the person that is responding to you is not a person. It is a machine. Uh, so it can type for you programs. It can say, uh, you know, uh, make a Shakespeare, make a, make a sketch, a single act play in the style of Shakespeare. Um, and use a modern context, say uh, uh, the Prime Minister of UK, for example. And uh, you will have a paragraph that looks like Shakespeare wrote about the Prime Minister of the UK. And this is a computer, right? It doesn't know who is the Prime Minister of UK and who is, the, uh, who is Shakespeare or what is the style of Shakespeare. But it's just been fed an incredible amount of data that it has read on its own, understood it, uh, stored it in structures and is pushing it back to you in a way that you as a human being can understand 
this is about the current prime minister of the UK, and it's written in the style that Shakespeare would write. Robotics, we've seen it in the caricature that I've put it up in the first uh, slide here today. Uh, and we have seen several factories, whether it be uh, Amazon warehouses or automotive factories or uh, factories that assemble pharmaceuticals, um, you know, for, for global supply and distribution, as we've seen in the corona phase. Robots are almost entirely, um, you know, almost invisibly taken over the shop floor, right? There are so many robots today that do applications that human beings were doing not so long back, dangerous things, uh, for things that fatigue a human being beyond a certain limit, uh, robots are able to do them tirelessly. Of course, there are safety issues, of course, there are power consumption issues, uh, but the efficiency and the productivity gain far outweigh uh, the costs of these things. Digital twins, right, sounds, um, sounds like a biological term, but is actually, something that uh, has taken off in the recent past. Um, you know, how can I use the data that comes out of uh, the everyday actions that we do, whether it is procuring stuff, manufacturing things, distribution uh, of things, cars, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, Amazon books, whatever you buy, excuse me. You collect data. You collect data about the location of where your components have gone, where are they coming from, uh, are they delayed? Uh, are they on time? Are they of the right quality? Are they not fitting you because something went wrong in the process? Various things uh, which are data that were earlier, what we can call dark data, which is data that we did not know how to use or data that could not be used. Today, that data is possible to be used because we have uh, the earlier aspect of computing power. So the digital twins uh, helps you make a model of your physical world. So it's a twin in that sense, and it works with data that you have generated in the past. So it is your own information. So you've actually cloned your physical infrastructure into a digital system, uh, and then using a process of, and that sits on the cloud, and using a process of machine learning, you are able to understand what went wrong in the past. Imagine if all that data that you had, you could actually predict uh, using some modeling, uh, what would happen, you know, and what is the confidence level with which you can predict what will happen, right? So if this upstream machine failed, what is the likelihood that I will have a problem somewhere downstream? Or if this went down for maintenance, what is the impact that it would have on my capacity? So you can make these models and far easier, you know, far more simpler way, because just like I gave the example of Google Pay, and the elderly generation, it is possible for a less computer savvy person to use these models to understand what is likely to happen and make a business intelligent decision that way, right? And one of the fundamental premises that uh, I was working not so long back was, um, you know, behavior at the workplace, right? And we normally assume that when somebody comes into work, uh, they come with the best intentions, right? They want to do the best, they want to deliver the best for the organization and so on. So if you put the factors um, that they can work with, if you put them, uh, give them parameters on which they can make a good decision, uh, more often than not, your expectation is that they will make the right decision. They may get overwhelmed because of the amount of data that they have to process. Uh, but if they understand it and if they're given it in a simple enough way, uh, they will make a good decision. Uh, so some of these things are basically helping the human being at the center of it all. Uh, to understand and to take actions that are meaningful and that are beneficial for the organization in the long run. Drones, flying cars, drones we have seen. Um, a lot of companies, DHL, Amazon, they are piloting drones. India still has to have a policy on drones. Flying people, I mean, we have seen Iron Man, of course, in Marvel, but uh, flying people are not yet a reality. Flying cars are fast becoming a reality. Uh, though um, I shudder to think with the conditions of Indian roads, uh, how flying cars would be in India. Uh, but as an aside, right, I'm sure uh, we will find the policies and the frameworks that will help manage this. But uh, it's an interesting time for figuring out how autonomous flight uh, can help our lives uh, become better. Uh, in India, this seems a little bit far-fetched, so I'm just going to leave it there as one of the elements that is coming in. Brain-computer interfaces. 
Um, you would have seen recently the owner of Tesla, Mr. Elon Musk, talking about um, some technologies around this. Um, you know, there are videos on the internet in YouTube uh, where a paraplegic man uh, kicks off a football uh, to inaugurate uh, a football tournament in South America. Uh, unimaginable a couple of decades ago. Uh, and he controlled his limbs. He, he couldn't move his limbs, arms or legs because of an accident. And he was actually controlling his limbs uh, using an exoskeleton that was hooked onto his brain. All right. Uh, so imagine the quality of life that is possible uh, by providing some of this in a more uh, mobile fashion. Right. And we will get there, I believe. Virtual and augmented reality. Um, a lot of us are hearing about metaverse. Uh, I, for one, am still confused as to how this can be used, uh, but we are already seeing some practical applications like self-driving cars, for example, um, is one of the examples where uh, augmented reality is making this a reality today in various uh, Western countries. Um, also, when a worker is actually managing on the shop floor, uh, she can actually look at various warehouse shelves, understand what is the product there using a combination of augmented reality, RFID, uh, and uh, whatever app business application they are running in the warehouse. So it's possible for even today, uh, using Oculus or Google Lens or any of these technologies to identify what is happening in the shop floor. And this is a reality too. Um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, I will talk about this a little bit. A um, couple of companies that I have um, the privilege of being associated with uh, are doing something that is path breaking um, from an Indian society point of view. Uh, blockchain technology, we hear a lot about this. Uh, this has been an experiment. Um, of course, it does involve some bit of regulation, but not in the fintech area, which is where uh, we are seeing a lot of bubbles and bursts uh, in the recent past, crypto and whatnot, uh, but more in the physical domain. Uh, in domains like automotive spares, in domains like pharmaceuticals and so on. Uh, so I'll be talking about it a little bit too. Biotechnology, um, like I mentioned a little while ago, uh, it is one of those areas that has come uh, very close to engineering and manufacturing these days because of the kind of combinations of technologies that we can bring. What used to be earlier a very pristine terrain, only a few people can get in, has become a more generic, more democratic area for people to participate. And finally, nanotechnology. Um, a lot of research has happened in the last several decades in nanotechnology. Now we are seeing slowly the packaging applications of some of these things uh, enter into even Indian industry, right? Because one of the things that the government has uh, over the last couple of decades is how can we use the productivity and the gains uh, for uh, the agricultural sector, given the large number of people that are employed there. Um, and food processing was one of the thrust areas for several years across multiple governments. Um, and nanotechnology plays a part in that. So how does it all work together? Right. I think I've touched upon it a little bit. Krish, we've lost you. Uh, it is possible for us to take green energy on this side, uh, what is represented as a set of windmills into battery technologies, right? So we are seeing the explosion of battery supply chains in India. Even as recently as today morning, I was reading Amaraja Batteries is planning to set up uh, more units in Telangana for, you know, not just batteries, but also uh, battery swap infrastructure. Um, of course, we have CFL lamps and so on, the mobile phone and the internet um, that we are seeing here, connecting up uh, people and the machines that run drones and the factories and the robots that sit in the factory, right? Now, if you imagine um, this for a bit, it is not just the big blocks. Of course, this is the security aspect of it. Uh, it is not just the big blocks, the people, the security, the computers and the drones, but these lines, that are actually connecting these various technologies together that are important, right? Now, just imagine if these were all just to kind of relate it uh, to our everyday life. Um, and if this was a cross-section of an Indian society, an Indian state where there are people from multiple 
regions, multiple states of India living together, and somebody speaking Odia, and somebody speaking Hindi, and somebody speaking Assamese, uh, and they don't have a common language. They don't have English or Hindi or any common language that they can talk to each other. Imagine how this communication would be, right? It is it is going to be hard. There are going to be you know, additional interpreters sitting here and there, which are trying to understand from both and then telling the other guy what the first person was talking. Here, these lines, uh, this common infrastructure of data transfer and integration play just as much an important role as these objects themselves, right? So for us to understand this, uh, the one, uh, one network, open network digital commerce that the government is launching, uh, imagine thousands and thousands and thousands of Indian small industries uh, or, you know, uh, almost micro industries hooking on to this um, big network and being able to transact anywhere in India with people that may not know the language, but the computer knows what they're talking about. They know whether they are buying a piece of fabric, uh, which this is not available in their uh, state. Uh, or whether they are buying uh, a machinery part which has a sophisticated amount of technology that they want to evaluate and uh, take for themselves. Um, so each of these components, including the lines, is important. Uh, the data transfer across these and the standardization of the data flows across these different uh, elements of the entire Industry 4 network uh, is very, very important. Uh, and most crucial is the part that uh, says you need to be, you know, controlled by a secure layer. At the end of it, uh, security that you are not losing your ideas or your intellectual properties uh, or even your data, uh, simple things like your date of birth and your gender and so on and so forth to uh, fraudulent people. Uh, that is something that is very crucial. And here is where I think the biggest challenge will be uh, as we move forward, right? Um, so this is broadly the industry for what are the things that go into it, how they are likely to work, what are the important dimensions of this um, whole architecture. And I'm talking at the industry level, so the architecture is a little um, you know, brief and it's a very line diagram kind of architecture. Um, but there are certain dimensions that we can deep dive into as we go through this uh, discussion today, right? Um, I will quickly walk you through my perspective, my point of view on what Industry 4 means for India, the advantages and the disadvantages and so on. Where are we? How have we journeyed in the last 40, 50 years? Um, and then I'll take a small pause um, where I'll request my collaborator, Professor Amresh, to pitch in because he has a lot of perspective from a policy standpoint, from an academic standpoint, um, and we will take a pause in a few minutes from now. So what has our journey been um, in the last 60 years, if I look at it? You can see that the manufacturing value added at constant US dollars taken at 2015 rates has been on a steep incline upwards, right? The proportion of labor employed in manufacturing also has shown a steep increase. Right. And both these are coming from World Bank national account data. So it's publicly available. You can, you can source it uh, anytime you want. Um, but if you look at the share of manufacturing as a percentage of GDP, you know the story is very different. The story is that we have been stagnating at around 15 to 17% in that ballpark uh, forever. You know, for the last 50 years, we've been at the same rate. And we are you know, marching. So... Um, the perception is that we are marching towards a $5 trillion economy, um, but manufacturing is somehow probably not got the memo, right? Uh, so they are still, there are still bottlenecks, uh, there are still challenges, uh, real challenges, some of them imaginary challenges uh, that we need to overcome as a country, right? And as, as we work towards overcoming them, uh, the possibility that manufacturing alone uh, will contribute about 25, 20 to 25% of the total value of 5 trillion is a real possibility. And we stand at the cusp of that. And there are multiple factors uh, that are giving us this advantage. And it is good for us to also identify for ourselves uh, what are the disadvantages that we have to overcome or the challenges we have to overcome. So uh, this is from Mr. Vijay Shah. It's a direct quote from what he, he gave an interview in the Forbes India magazine in March. 
Um, he is the executive director in Pyramal Glass. Uh, so this is the expectation, right? The industry expectation is 80% of manufacturing industry is expecting a greater than 10% improvement in efficiency. And people are expecting uh, a 10% improvement in additional in revenue, right? Uh, industry will also industry four will also yield the benefit of a faster learning cycle. So there are a lot of expectations. Right? Faster learning cycle, we will compete with the legacy producers in Europe and America, uh, who, who are already <clears throat> having a head start and so on. This was pre-COVID, um, and obviously, industry four in India even today because of the pause we had on COVID. Uh, we are still at the starting blocks, so to say, right? So this, this is the expectation. So if I just dive down a little bit and say, what are we looking at? Okay, broadly speaking, and this is the section where I told you that we will talk at a high level initially and then go down to industry examples. So we're talking of broadly three areas, policies and regulatory environment, uh, skills and productivity of labor, because that's a very key aspect of the nature of the market that India is. India is a labor it's, we are not a labor deficient market. We are a labor excessive market at this point in time. We have more disguised unemployment in multiple sectors, including agriculture. Uh, more people are employed for doing the work of one person. Um, so we need to understand how we can, excuse me, I'll just have a sip of water. And more importantly, how we can protect the intellectual property um, that most companies in the world are bothered about, right? How um, they will control and they will uh, make sure that their IP rights are protected. We will talk about this in a little detail. So the first, I've broadly broken this down into two. Um, so let me just move this on this side a little bit. Yeah. So when we talk about the Indian context and the policies in the regulatory environment, uh, on the left side of the slide today, we have the various advantages or the opportunities for ourselves uh, and the disadvantages here. And the next two or three slides will go in this fashion. Uh, so the first thing is we have a very conscious effort from the government uh, to kind of uh, work on a make in India policy, right? So this is one of the points that was raised also in the IIT ACB manufacturing conclave a couple of years ago. Should we make or should we buy? Um, and one of the panelists was saying that it's easier to source from Thailand, which has a free trade zone with India, uh, than it is to source from uh, Roper, as an example. Right. So, thankfully, we are moving more towards a Make in India policy. We are trying to see how we can improve, but you know, more can be done, more should be done. Uh, but we have Make in India is hopefully an umbrella program, at least to my eyes, it appears so. Uh, which also encompasses Startup India, Digital India, and Skill India as multiple programs and initiatives that the government is working on. All good with the right intention, uh, which is tapping into the demography and the aspirational growth that we, we see. So the demography and the aspirational growth, um, we have, you know, we must have heard about the demographic dividend. We have more people that are coming into the workforce on a monthly basis these days. Uh, almost a million young men and women enter working age every month. That's the kind of scale that we are talking about. Um, and thankfully, because of COVID, uh, more companies are looking at alternates to China. So China plus one, uh, there are a lot of articles out there uh, which tell us uh, that you know India should be in the forefront of China plus one. Some companies have moved, some companies haven't. At the moment, uh, there are more companies that are selecting com countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh um, and other parts of Southeast Asia over India. Right? And there is something there we need to look at um, very urgently. Ease of doing business, we are improving. Uh, the production linked incentive scheme is making life a little bit easier, uh, but there are also critics of the PLI. Right. So while there are advantages, there are uh, some more improvements that is possible in these policy actions. But of course, uh, these um, disadvantages and risks uh, are well known. Uh, we have been a fragmented market for a very long time. Uh, taxation laws, particularly um, till the GST came into place, uh, were quite difficult to navigate in the Indian context. It has um, 
it has improved a lot it has improved dramatically after gst but there are also some disadvantages some points of criticism on the gst which uh, which the government is hopefully looking at land laws and labor laws um, are the hardest ones because they are uh, they affect a large number of people uh, so there is a lot of um, i would say multiple uh, points of interest uh, on both land and labor Uh, which the government needs to navigate which also the industry needs to um, you know understand and sensitize the government to so that there is a win win for all the stakeholders concerned people that own land or the workers that the industry is interested in um, and how we can hire and how we can let go of people um, you know so that but their futures and the economic safety of these people are not affected so there is a lot to do um, and today because of these uh, fragmentations uh, there is still a bit of hesitation about industry and they demand that the government take care of a lot of these actions on their own because coercive power only remains with the government right in a in a democracy like ours uh, of course infrastructure development has got a huge fillip in the recent past but there is always a but uh, logistics is still a challenge uh, the cost of logistics moving goods from one one town or one industrial center to another is anywhere between 50 to 70% costlier than any other comparable country in the world urban congestion we all live through it a lot of us are urban dwellers um, and there have been many days where each one of us would have thought how nice it would have been if i if i could just go uh, and emulate mr sridhar vembu settle down in tenkashi or some place and uh, you know build a center there where i'm far away from the city but no today urban centers offers the most economic <laughs> opportunities so people still migrate into urban centers rather than out of it uh, and this causes a real problem it causes an excess employment in the cities it causes a deficiency of employment formal employment in the rural areas or semi urban areas um, and this remains a challenge it will continue to remain a challenge till infrastructure is addressed and of course access to water and sanitation right this is critical again a lot of this has been done um but more needs to be done these are all huge mountains to cross um and it always will take time there will always be criticisms uh, but i think we are setting the direction in the right way uh, there is a real amount of intent uh, i'm sure all of us have experienced it in various uh, degrees uh, but i'm hoping uh, these advantages and these disadvantages uh, will work in our favor right the disadvantages to be mitigated and the advantages to be strengthened um excuse me yeah we have a burgeoning labor market i mentioned 1 million enters the job market every month we have and i've categorized this very deliberately a low labor participation rate for women in the workforce right which means there is a large amount of women that are untapped that are probably skilled that can be employed in meaningful skilled work like for example assembling a mobile phone is something that a woman worker can do much better than a male worker simply because the size of her hands are much finer than a male worker's hands right and that's biological nothing you can do about it so there are a lot of this fine electronics advanced electronic assemblies that could be done and we have a large low labor participation and women in rural india are looking for better jobs just like men are looking for better jobs um, i am sure a lot of them do not want to do the agricultural manual labor and they would be benefited by a formal employment uh, given a chance given an opportunity and the government is putting a lot of effort in focused skill building right at the same time um, there are again mountains to climb if you look at it infrastructure alone which is our biggest problem to date in india uh, if you look at any foreign report uh, investment banking or investment reports they mention infrastructure and not in a positive way uh, despite the fact that literally billions of dollars have been spent in upgrading the infrastructure right over the last i don't know 30 35 years a lot of investments have been gone have been made into ports into airports into um, road infrastructure into inland shipping uh, but still more needs to be done infrastructure alone has a skill shortage of 103 million people automotive 35 million transport logistics 17 million healthcare 12 million 13 million so if you look at this um, you know these are the industries these are the sectors where healthcare for example or transport logistics or uh, travel and tourism 
are sectors where women can be employed. You know, they are safe jobs. Uh, they require um, a different set of skills, which probably a woman will readily bring to the table. Um, and it is possible for them to be gainfully employed and grow and have a secure future for them and their families, um, obviously resulting in huge economic gains for the government, for the, for the community. Um, but at the end of the day, we do not have training capacity. So if you have a young girl who's coming from a rural area and she wants to become a nurse, she wants to get trained, uh, she'll have a few institutes. Those institutes, um, you know, she has to pay a fees or if the institute offers the training for free, who will pay for the training? Maybe she doesn't have the wherewithal to pay for training. So the first question is, will the healthcare industry pay? Uh, their answer would be, why would I subsidize somebody's education when I can't benefit from it? And that's a fair question. So the training capacity question on who will pay, who is accountable for making these people skilled and deployable in an industry context is very critical. Uh, the lack of industry faculty interactions. Now this is improving um, with platforms like this, like the one we are in today, uh, but can academics, academia, and industry collaborate? The answers are found already. Um, you know, some of them I will talk about today. Uh, but the question remains for these industry faculty or industry academia interactions, who will pay? Right? If we have to do it, internships for students, if we have to do projects, uh, you know, industry projects by the academia. Uh, who will sponsor, whether the industry will sponsor exploratory uh, research into some of these areas, which are, which are unknown today, right? How do I know what to do with a brain computer interface, right? But uh, if there is a practical application of that, I'm sure a lot of industry people would be immediately interested, but somebody has to pay, right? Uh, 3D printing, when it took uh, shape, nobody would be bothered to look at it, but today everybody wants to jump into 3D printing. So, if there is somebody who can foot the bill for some of these exploratory discussions and research, there would be a lot more progress that is possible. So the question that we need to answer pretty urgently is who will pay, right? Because it needs to make sense at the end of the day. That is the important thing. The Indian context, right? So one of the questions that is being addressed, the academy and industry interactions, is the 10,000 startups of NASCOM. This is a pretty famous program. Uh, they want to have 10,000 startups under the ages, under the ambit of NASCOM. And they are growing a lot of them. And a lot of them are doing phenomenal work, eye-poppingly, you know, surprising work, right, in a very, very positive sense. And it's, it's a huge matter of pride as an Indian, as a person of this country, uh, for us to see uh, the kind of work that we can do if we just put our mind and will to it. Uh, IPR regime is being modernized. Again, the criticism is that it's not being modernized fast enough. Uh, we are in compliance with TRIPS of WTO, but um, again, a but, we need to do more, right? Uh, so the um, evergreening of patents is not possible. So there is a lot of resistance from Western countries who have patents, who are sitting on patents to share that with our country. Of course, we have our own point of view on that, uh, which says as a, as a developing country, some of these patents ought to be shared so that the larger humanity will benefit. Um, alas, there is, uh, you know, not many guys uh, still around like the inventor of the polio vaccine who gave it away for free to the world. And today we have no polio in the world, right? There aren't so many people left. Everybody wants to have their research payback uh, on an ROI. Uh, but yeah, I am a little bit of a, of a romantic in these matters that knowledge are to be shared. Uh, and the more we are able to share the knowledge, the better uh, we all will be collectively, right? Um, India is on the U.S. Trade Representative's priority watch list for IPR. How we get out of that, I am not the expert. I wouldn't know. Um, weak data protection and data privacy laws. We are in the process of addressing this. Uh, and hopefully, um, our data privacy bill, which is currently going through various committees in the parliament, uh, will come out in a way that meets some of the expectations of the rest of the world. So at this point in time, um, I will pause. I will request Professor Murin to check in um, and uh, you know provide his perspective because till this section or till this slide of the presentation, um, I've been talking very high level. Right? Uh, and at this point in time, um, 
there is a perspective that I think will be valuable for us to hear from Professor. Professor, over to you. I'll put myself on mute. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Sivrama Krishnan Narayan, uh, for your views. Uh, wonderful. Uh, there are two, uh, I think I have been already warned by Dr. Sushila that we are running uh, behind time and therefore we shouldn't take too long on this. So let me just say a couple of points and then maybe take one or two questions that, that are already enlisted in the Q&A uh, so that we can also involve our, uh, our uh, participants in the discussion. So uh, I would say that, uh, um, you know, one way to look at Industry 4.0 uh, is to, to say that um, that from industry 3.0, if you like, it, it sort of translates from automation or individual automation to uh, institutional or organizational autonomy. That's the distinctive feature of industry 4.0. Not that you have achieved it, but that's the ideal. How do you, how do you have a connected system where uh, there can be connected intelligence with which more can be achieved with uh, what is available. Uh, so uh, the, the, there is a question that, that is there. Uh, I would just start with that uh, and I'll just read it out because it rather framed rather well uh, by Mr. Uh, Rahura. What are some first steps that a traditional company can take to embark on an industry 4.0 journey without getting overwhelmed by the plethora of technologies? So please yeah. go ahead. So this is uh, like they say, uh, like eating an elephant, right? It's one small, uh, one small piece at a time. So the first thing that I would look at is what is the data that is available uh, to the company, right? Where are there any tasks, any daily daily uh, transactions that need to be automated that can be connected in a different way? Um, so to give you an example. I was visiting this company yesterday, which is in the aerospace business and uh, in the aerospace business because of safety reasons and regulatory reasons, uh, they will have to maintain an invoice uh, for every part. Every single part they ship out of their company uh, goes on a separate invoice. Now, this, this company makes uh, something of the equivalent of 18,000 different parts and obviously multiple copies of the same part has to be invoiced out. Uh, so they run uh, in the region of about 200 to 300,000 invoices a year. Now, if this were uh, to be entered by a human being or a team of human beings every day, uh, you would need an army of human beings doing this entry. This company has embarked upon a journey called robotic process automation, where a robot, a software robot, is entering the invoices into their ERP transaction system automatically. So they just feed the data into a standard format and uh, the, uh, the uh, robot actually enters the data and uh, you know they manage this whole uh, operation with two people. Now this is, you know, at the face of it, uh, you have actually lost the employment of, uh, of 10 people uh, that could otherwise potentially be doing invoice entry. Uh, but the question is, do you really want those people to do invoice entry or do you want those 10 people that you could otherwise deploy in another more value added job? Um, and the answer is obviously the second, right? You would want them to do a more value added work. So it's a small area where they have started. Now they have understood, okay, this is a good step forward. Now, can I do this robotic process, whatever, in other areas of my shop? Can I do this in my warehouse? Can I do this? in some other procurement related activities that, uh, that I have today, where I have a huge amount of data or data entry, right? So it, it goes like this, it's an organic journey. It's not something that you should impose from top. Of course, there is a little bit of direction and vision required for the company, uh, but areas where you can actually generate, obtain a, an, a gain in efficiency. Um, and some of those will be pretty obvious when you start. Uh, would be the way to go. That's normally how companies start these journeys. Look at one aspect and see whether you can fix that. And then you're off. You don't need to think about it too much. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we'll just take one more question and then move back to your presentation again. And I will perhaps uh, ask uh, the following that... Uh, 
there is a in a, in a sense and i'm just expanding someone someone's question here a little bit that uh, there is a if industry 4.0 gets implemented uh, as the uh, it's being promulgated right then you are going to have these millions of sensors uh, iot devices and so on and so forth uh, that would be deployed in addition to the uh, energy perhaps energy intensive technologies that are already there so I have seen and uh, noticed that you have said green technology or green energy, but that alone is perhaps not enough. I mean, it's surely going to be far more capital intensive than it is right yes. now. So how does yes. it how does it help us to remain or become more sustainable while being you know industry 4.0 savvy? <laughs> so brilliant question, Professor. Thank you. So that is one of the dilemmas that we have today, right? So we don't see the impact of the large uh, data centers that we, uh, you know, somehow implicitly consume. I mean, all of us are on Facebook or Google or Twitter or any of these uh, or Amazon uh, in various forms. Um, and we don't really see the impact of these giant uh, data centers that are running in various places that are today considered one of the largest generators of greenhouse gases in the world. Um, so I don't have an answer to you. It is a it is a very valid question. Uh, when we have sensors and when we have instruments that are generating millions of data points per single piece manufactured, um, we are going to have a huge data center problem. And I don't know what we have to do. Uh, it is definitely not sustainable the way we are managing our data centers today, and that's something to think about. But no, I I don't have an answer for this. You're on mute, Professor. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was just saying that this is the last question I'm going to ask before I give give the mantle back to you for the rest of the presentation. Sure. Sure. And that's the following, because this is an oft asked question, right? Uh, I'm not necessarily expecting an answer, but I would still like to, to you to deliver it on it. And that is, sure. what does industry 4.0 mean in terms of employment? Generation. Oh, I have that as a question as well. Right. Um, uh, so I will answer that in a little bit if I may park this for the moment, uh, because it is one of the questions that I have taken up to be addressed as part of the, you know, the final set of uh, okay. deliberations. Brilliant. So, so then please defer that and please go okay. back to your presentation. Sure. I'm sharing my screen again, if I can just get a confirmation that you all can see my screen. I can see. Okay. Um, so let me go down now to the um, examples of industry four in India. I'll spend a little bit um, this part of the presentation because I can't name the companies. Um, they are all <clears throat> companies here in India that are doing this kind of work. Um, but I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with any of you. Using nanotechnology for food packaging. I briefly touched upon this uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, so if you're manufacturing chips or if you're manufacturing, say, uh, idli batter, okay, and a lot of companies are there in the market today, uh, one of the key things that, or even coffee powder, for example, a lot of companies are there which are trying to go direct to consumer, right, to, to take um, products, agricultural products from the farm, process it in some way, deliver it to the consumer as fresh as possible so she can actually enjoy the benefit of fresh food. Um, and keeping it fresh. I mean, uh, these days I find raw mangoes, which was for me a treat in the summer months, in the month of October and November, right? During Diwali, I was, I was happily chomping down a raw mango. Um, and that's an incredible uh, agricultural feat, if I may say so. And some of this is part of the green supply chain or the nanotechnology enabled supply chain that we see in the, in the food processing business or even deep freeze or frozen supply chains um, that we see. Um, so this um, has made food pressure more accessible to consumers in even off season. And that's something that people are working on. And this is also to a certain extent applicable in the pharmaceutical industry, nanotechnology based packaging. Um, Using biotechnology and nanotechnology to manufacture artificial skin, I think all of us can immediately understand uh, the applications of such a such a manufactured product. Uh, natural skin is a difficult thing to source. Um, skin grafting is something that is required, unfortunately, in many many 
um, hospitals for different reasons. Uh, but it is possible to treat this using artificial skin. Uh, what is even more incredible is 3D technology, 3D printing technology has gotten into the act as well. So it's possible for us to print skin. Okay, there are companies in Bangalore that can print liver tissue. And I'm, you know, you heard me right. There are people that can print liver tissue. Okay. And a company that I have had the privilege of associating myself is in the business of printing corneal tissue, eye tissue, right? And there is a condition um, that causes uh, incurable blindness. And there are about 6 lakh people, 600,000 people in India that go blind because of this condition on, an, on every year, right? 6 lakh people every year go blind because of this eye condition, which is peculiar to the South uh, Asian region. Uh, and this company is in the business of actually working on a path-breaking technology that prints eye tissue that can cure blindness. Imagine the societal impact of this, right? So, so this is, you know, somewhere uh, it goes beyond just manufacturing, it becomes inspiration, right? Um, a lot of this is happening right here, and some of it is in Bangalore, using blockchain technologies to prevent counterfeiting. Now, this is an old you know, in, in uh, relative terms, uh, an old problem, um, you know, fakes in pharmaceutical business, right? Fake tablets, the unfortunate incident of young children dying in uh, Ghana, I believe, uh, consuming substandard cough syrup um, and also maybe spurious medicines or spurious uh, spares in say machinery or automotive parts, uh, spurious parts, which cause accidents and death. Uh, so can we use blockchain technologies to prevent counterfeiting? Can we use a permission blockchain with, uh, with security in place so that we can only allow trusted parties to join? So this is a, a wonderful application of blockchain which doesn't cause monetary loss, which, which prevents actually the risk of death because of spurious parts or spurious medicines, um, saves lives, uh, saves cost because otherwise manufacturers have to spend lots of money countering counterfeits in the, in the shop, in the market. And this is happening right here. Okay. Some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in India, in the West, uh, in the Western part of India, for example, have been experimenting uh, with this for at least at least a decade till now. So, like I was mentioning, a small part, which is you know something that offers an advantage to you as a company, if you start an experiment there, and if that experiment is successful, then you can actually uh, start moving it into other areas of your business. Um, and this is a one of the best examples I can give you of using blockchain um, for counterfeit management or counterfeit preventing counterfeit. Using drones, automated guided vehicles, right? So very recently we may have read in the news about Reliance acquiring a company uh, which is in the business of automated, uh, aut sorry, autonomous guided vehicles in a warehouse, right? And that's their business. This is an Indian startup uh, that is making this happen. There are large warehouses with, uh, with say, for example, Amazon or the Indian company Udan or urban company, uh, urban, urban Ladder, which is the furniture company or Pepper Fry. Huge warehouses where you do not know where your product is um, stocked in the warehouse. It's possible for you to deploy some of these things. I have seen, I have worked in steel factories for a bit. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in steel is to identify the specific piece of steel that you need to ship to your customer. And having, <clears throat> having a, a drone uh, in a yard, which could be a kilometer long, uh, can be a massive advantage right? uh, about selecting and loading that uh, particular steel coil or steel slab onto a, onto a rail wagon. <clears throat> um, also cars, I mean, we've all seen, those of you who've seen automobile uh, showrooms or automobile yards, again, it runs into a couple of kilometers and there are literally thousands of cars of various colors that are parked in these yards prior to shipment. Uh, identifying those cars, where they are, and then picking it up and putting it on a, on a, a truck for it to be shipped out is a big, big challenge, right? And there are people trying various things, including 5G technologies. And drone is something that I have seen personally happen, right? And this is a very simple application. Today, what happens is a worker goes every day, morning, afternoon, evening, walks through the yard, you know, uh, make sure that the car is in the place where it was supposed to be marked, right, in the system. If there is any change, then he makes a note on a paper, then it goes back into the system. They actually 
update it. A drone, on the other hand, uh, scans the RFID that is pasted on the car, uh, directly updates the system. There is no worker. What the worker does in six hours, the drone does in 15 minutes. Um, and there couldn't be a more you know, dramatic productivity gain that I can say in this. And this could be a car, this could be a steel uh, coil or a steel plate or any other large equipment that is in a big yard that may run for several kilometers. Um, blast furnace, right? One of the biggest challenges of energy consumption in the steel industry is how and where you position what is called the oxygen lance, right? So steel making involves a lot of injection of oxygen into the process. Uh, how do you position the oxygen lance? When do you inject the oxygen? At what angle do you inject it? Depends on a lot of furnace conditions that are not known, you know, that happens dynamically. And you, you melt typically anywhere between 150 tons to 200 tons of steel in one batch. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very dangerous environment, right? So the person that controls the oxygen lance looks like somebody from outer space, right? He's wearing, uh, typically it's a male, it's a very um, exhausting job. Uh, and he is standing there in 70 degree heat, uh, trying to manage an oxygen lance that has to be pushed into a live furnace. Uh, but if you have a machine learning model, then the oxygen lance can be actually positioned by a robot that can do it far more efficiently and far more accurately than a human being can. And this is something that is already happening in some of the Indian steel factories that I have visited. Right? So this is another very good example of how uh, you can make a small beginning because this is a typical case where the work environment is dangerous and uh, you know you need a lot of accuracy as well. And it's hard for a human being to maintain uh, accuracy in a highly toxic and dangerous environment. Using computer vision to identify workers' action on the shop floor, right? We've all seen CCTV, right? Um, and one of the auto companies that I have worked for in the past has, you know, typically automobile involved, involved a lot of welding on the body of the machine, on the body of the auto. Um, and weld tips, the way the welding technology is, weld tips get deposited with carbon. And one of the <clears throat> problems is if you have a weld tip uh, uh, which has been deposited with carbon, the weld quality kind of goes down. If the weld quality is down, then it could either be a safety issue for you or it could be just a, uh, an irritation because you will hear rattling two metal pieces will keep bumping into each other if they are not welded tightly together, right? So it could be an irritation or it could be a safety issue. If you have an accident, uh, the whole car falls apart uh, because of poor quality welds. So you have to dress the weld. Uh, you have to make sure that the carbon is removed and the weld uh, quality is maintained. Um, and it, what we were doing is using uh, CCTV cameras that were in the shop uh, to understand from the actions of the worker uh, whether they are actually maintaining those weld tips properly, right? So there are various actions that the welder does on the shop floor. So we actually trained a model, a machine learning model uh, that helps understand whether the welder, weld, the worker is dressing the weld tip or not uh, with a certain level of accuracy, right? So these actions are uh, from images. So we converted the images into numbers um, and classified the actions, a whole bunch of things that we did uh, which I'm happy to talk about in an offline conversation. Digital twins for complex systems, uh, like I was mentioning a little while earlier, using big data, using data that is coming in on the fly and using analytics to build complex things like supply chain models in an Indian context, where there are multiple handovers, multiple stakeholders, uh, multiple methods of data exchange. Uh, it is possible for us to build this. Big companies like Google are actually building digital twin platforms. Right. So if you want uh, to actually model your manufacturing or your procurement or your entire supply chain, uh, Google has an offering for you. It's incredible because some of these things um, you wouldn't even expect. Uh, you know, somebody we know more for their mail and their drive, Google Drive and Google Mail, to be interested in a digital supply chain solution, but you have it. Google has an interest and they have actually built a product that will help you do a supply chain twin. So uh, some of these are examples where I have worked myself. Some of them are examples where I've had the privilege to talk to uh, the CEOs or the founders of these startups. Uh, some of them are, are just uh, what I have read uh, in the internet and 
you know, because of my curiosity, done a little bit more digging, right? I'll not name which is which uh, for obvious reasons. These are all client confidential uh, information. Uh, but I'm happy to have a conversation on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, provide a little more detail on any of these various examples that I have spoken about. Um, so you can imagine the scope and the scale of work uh, from what uh, I have done. And there are other examples that I can just talk about. For example, enforcing contracts, right? One of the big challenges in uh, whether it is capital procurement or whether it is repetitive procurement is how do I enforce the contractual terms on my vendors? And today there are machine learning solutions available, which will highlight uh, to you. And there is an entire family of solutions called contract lifecycle management, uh, which is today powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning. <clears throat> uh, and it's uh, it's extraordinary how, um, how the solutions work. Um, Chat GPT, which I was talking about a little earlier, um, can replace, you know, potentially it can replace a million, three million, whatever number we have in the BPO industry. You can just put a chat bot. Uh, this can generate human-like responses and nobody would know. And you can even tweak the accent. So you can say, I want this chat bot to sound like an Australian and it will. You want this uh, chat bot to sound like a Nigerian, it will, right? And nobody will know uh, anything better. Today, uh, Google Assistant can book you a doctor's appointment or a haircut appointment, and the person that is receiving the call from Google Assistant will not even know that a robot is calling him or her. Uh, so some of these are scary. Some of these are incredible. For me, um, you know, without the uh, burden of, uh, of a moral compass, if I look at some of these technologies, um, it is incredible. Uh, but there is obviously a very strong amount of ethics required uh, to bring these technologies to the industry to make sure that the um, boundaries of uh, of human privacy or human decency or uh, human intellect are not violated. Right? It is. It is for us. These these are all human creations, uh, and we need to respect those boundaries. Right? So robots are very great, uh, but a weaponized robot is not so great. You know those kind of things. So there is there is going to be always this debate. Uh, there is going to be a lot of ethics uh, that are involved. Um, you know all those thought experiments about self-driving cars uh, and should it kill an old woman or should it kill a bunch of school children if confronted with such a moral dilemma? These are all famous problems in artificial intelligence. Uh, none of which for none of them I have any solution. Right. Uh, but the, there are better minds than me that are occupied with this, this problems, and I'm sure we'll find a way, or we'll find a compromise that looks practical, agreeable, ethical, and all of that. But you know, while here, uh, for me, the role today is to play the cheerleader for a lot of these technologies, and I am doing that job. Uh, there are also a lot of ethical, moral, uh, societal, legal considerations that we need to keep in mind as we embark on these journeys. And it's important, uh, just as important as the technologies themselves. Finally, a few concerns. Um, the first question that really comes to mind and that's not here on the, on the list uh, that was asked by one of the participants is, are these even relevant for India, right? Are, is industry four relevant for India? Should we do something else? Industry five, I think that is one of the questions, right? No. So, I think we have to learn to stand before we run, learn to stand before we walk. Even um, industry four uh, would be the where uh, would be the place where we go. Of course, industry five uh, is already taking shape. Technology always, uh, you know, advances in leaps and bounds. Uh, but we as a society need to adopt uh, those technologies that make sense for us. Um, and industry four, in my view, in my personal view, I think makes a lot of sense. It, it has huge potential. Uh, for improvement in society, for improvement in our productivity, for raising the livelihoods of millions of people, just like IT and IT services did it uh, between uh, the time that uh, the Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha opened up our economy along with Dr. Manmohan Singh. Uh, and we have really taken off. The kind of lives we lead uh, today are far different from the lives our parents led just a generation back. Uh, so industry four is the way to go. Industry four is very relevant. Um, and I believe manufacturing being the vehicle of growth, uh, would be the, uh, you know, the right way to go. 
so would it be cost efficient would be the second question that comes to would it be cost efficient right again the answer is maybe uh, i will not say it's an unqualified yes because a lot of these tech technologies today are expensive right a robot is probably as expensive as 100 workers working for a whole year would it pay off in the long run yes so we need companies who are committed to this in the long run who, who are willing to stay the course for say 5 years at least uh, invest in these technologies allow them to mature be stable in the environment that they are working in uh, and not look at this as a quarterly revenue kind of uh, and roi based uh, investment right so so there are dimensions to this um, it would depend on the industry it would depend on the like if you say i will put in a chatbot in a in a tourism industry the answer would be obviously no because tourism requires a lot of high touch right high interactions with the customers that you have uh, putting a chatbot in such an area would be a bad idea so there will be areas where cost efficiency is not the primary concern uh, there would be areas like bpo where cost efficiency is the primary concern so it would be selective it will be in a sense um, contextual uh, and industry has to adopt technologies where it makes sense and where it doesn't it should not um, are these technologies sustainable um, again it's a qualified yes um, exactly the question that professor asked earlier that if i start putting a thousand data points per every piece of manufactured item into a data center will my data center not become a huge uh, carbon energy a carbon green gas generator the answer is yes it will uh, the question for us then to answer is are the productivity gains and the visibility gains that i get out of this excuse me going to offset these gains uh, these uh, disadvantages um, that i'm getting out of greenhouse gases it's a qualified yes for now because i being uh, more from the manufacturing and the industry side um, a technology like this offers immense possibilities for productivity and growth uh, and those are the two primary factors that uh, that play in my mind sustainability is something that i'm still learning um, how to build sustainability in the solutions that we bring uh, as consultants to our clients uh, that's something that i i don't have the wherewithal to answer today but the answer should be yes they are sustainable they should be made sustainable will we give away our inherent democratic demographic dividend advantage you know we we read a lot of articles saying the next 30 years we have a lot of young men and women in the in the workforce we have you know our young people will go on till 2060 a lot of us will not have any careers left at that point in time uh but at that point in time the demographic dividend will end for india because already growth rates birth rates are falling will we give away our inherent demographic demographic dividend the answer is no i would say no we are not giving away our demographic dividend by adopting these technologies because a lot of the people that are coming into the workforce will work in jobs that we don't know today right the jobs that will exist in 2030 will be dramatically different from the jobs that we see today and for reasons i cannot fully articulate in a in a conversation of this nature but there are several things that didn't exist as recently as 5 years ago that exist now you hear a lot of data scientist roles if i had asked you a data scientist in 2010 10 years back uh, i am not sure if i would have got a consistent answer across three people let a normal large audience right so there are jobs that we have today um, like youtuber youtuber was not a job in 2007 today there are people making millions of dollars by being a youtuber or a tiktoker for that matter right so some of these things are very they are curious they are curious phenomenon of our society some of them are here to stay some of them will go away uh, but one thing is sure that we will not give away our demographic dividend because the young men and women will be doing a lot different jobs that will be freed i mean just imagine uh, we have i don't know close to a million sanitation workers in india and if we had sanitation robots that cleaned up our drains that's a million people that we can otherwise employ right i'm being a little bit dramatic here but you get the picture right do you want your young men and women to be sanitation workers or do you want them to do something more meaningful 
if i asked that question the answer would be obviously no i don't want people to be sanitation workers they are doing sanitation work because they don't have any better opportunities so if i can create those opportunities by using any of these technologies then i have some dramatic impact on the society maybe all million will not get out maybe half of them will but that's a dream that we can all aspire to have do we have necessary skills um no at the moment and one of the big things that we need to do the soft infrastructure for training you know not not the variety of training that we get to end, uh, write iit entrance exams but the training that makes a real economic difference to the people to the people that are not writing iit exams you know government jobs across india whether it's in the south north east or west uh, have applicants uh, you know for every seat there are 100 applicants writing that exam and people over qualified not getting jobs for years and so on and so forth because simply they don't have the skills and they want a government job to just secure their future can we secure their future through skills the answer is yes we have to provide those infrastructures to them and the more we make our people skilled the better we will be in a position to use these technologies and grow <laughs> the impact of skilling our people making use of their skills to open up opportunities that did not exist before is immense right i mean i i cannot overstate the importance of skills um and learning and i think india is waking up to this possibility that uh, we may lose our demographic dividend if we don't skill our people adequately in time so there is a lot of thrust there is a lot of importance being given to skilling people to educating our children in the right way so that they come out with literary and numeral numeracy skills uh that can earn them a, a rupee in the market right and that's important it's important for us to build meaningful jobs will they take away jobs from new indians no the answer is no they will actually free young indians to take up jobs that make sense to them in the longer run and i this is this is something i will, i believe very strongly uh, i am a very at my heart i am a very technology savvy technology friendly person uh so i believe technologies will free us uh, will make us more productive i see the positive effects of technology on society um and that will result in leverage for our young indians i'll give you a small example i was volunteering for a um, you know giving my time for social causes uh, diversity and inclusiveness in indian society is is pretty low uh, those of you who traveled in and out of bangalore uh, would have seen mitti cafe in the airport now mitti cafe is a cafe by a young indian uh, who has taken upon herself to provide employment meaningful employment for disabled people people with down syndrome people with hearing disabilities or you know blindness and so on uh, and they have a lot of pride uh, in the work they do they actually serve it's a cafe uh, they serve you snacks tea coffee and they serve it with such joy uh your heart is filled not just you know you're craving for tea or coffee or a snack uh but you you're just overwhelmed by the amount of pride these young men and women uh display when they are doing something as mundane as a job serving tea or coffee to people right now imagine this multiplied 100 fold if you were to create jobs for disabled people people because of artificial intelligence or machine learning or touch sensors or any other different types of technologies that we have today robots you can imagine virtual reality augmented reality you have a person who is a hearing uh, disabled person who is working in an amazon warehouse and she is able to look at a warehouse shelf and understand what is going on in that shelf what is the product what has to be packed next what has to be where is, where, is, where should it be shipped she makes those decisions because technology is facilitating today we see a lot of blind people that are able to use a computer like this like a laptop because there are voice activated commands right these are all small examples of how we can bring technology to help people with skills or abilities lesser than an able bodied young man or woman uh, to be productive right instead of serving coffee and tea if such a person was also able to make i mean while phone or send out a package to a customer uh, in some part of india that person would be so proud of the job that they are doing that they will actually bring 10 more people into the into the work life into the work stream right 
and these are small jobs these are not i'm not talking of some rocket science kind of jobs these are everyday jobs these are required to keep our wheels running uh, healthcare workers you know uh, there are so many opportunities which technology can open this kind of technologies can open that i don't believe that jobs will be lost i believe jobs will be created right so that is uh, my take on this whole thing uh, that brings us to the end of the hour i have some references in the deck i'm sure this will you know be of much use to you these are all on youtube uh, they are available publicly um, and i would love for them to uh, be watched by you there are there is a ted talk there is something around industry 4 there is a lecture please have a look i mean these are incredibly insightful videos uh, please have a look and uh, you know i hope uh, some of you can make a journey start one last thing right what kind of skills do you need um today that is one of the questions that came up uh, sorry i'm just looking at the q and a uh, what kind of skills do you need uh, skills that you need um we already have, excuse me sorry should close this uh, skills that we need uh, are essentially around data data management all this yeah. we have an inherent advantage i think that was one of the questions we have an inherent advantage because we already have a lot of these technology skills we are an international service driven economy very connected to the western world we deliver a lot of services to them uh, some of those will translate to better manufacturing product capabilities we have a lot of issues in manufacturing today we have you know a lot of industries that i go to they talk about the uh, seasonal workforce right so people that are cutting sugar cane during the sugar season come to work in factories during the non sugar season right so between cutting sugar cane and assembling a, a, an automotive vehicle or working in a steel factory there is a huge difference and that brings a lot of skill gap to our manufacturing um our chalta hai attitude which is not normally <clears throat> a good thing impacts the quality uh, of products that we generate so the diligence and the quality that we can see in us for example a vietnamese product is not there in an indian product and that's something we have to fix as a society so that's not just the job of the government to do uh, so there are a lot of things that we should do we can do uh, what are the skills currently we have a lot of those skills we have a lot of skills we have a lot of understanding of the market driven uh, demands for services the quality the diligence the discipline that we need to do uh, and i'm not talking of the technology skills at all right the manufacturing technologies uh, for the moment we will have to probably buy import from western the western world or, or even china or japan uh, but there is something that we can bring that is unique there is one there is a large population that we can bring uh, it's almost an endless well right we can bring people at will and we do bring people at will and that will make a huge difference we can bring a lot of quality education to the table which is one of the main differentiating factors uh, in manufacturing as we go along this journey and we have a demographic dividend that is expected to last for another 40 years and that's an incredible amount of time in a country of our nature um, and we will cross our 100th year uh, still in the middle of the demographic dividend it's for us to seize this moment and make it happen for ourselves thank you so much sushila so, of samrish uh thank you thank you again um maybe we just take two or three uh, questions uh, so maybe uh, you know there, there is a question that someone asked saying that we also hear about the industry 5.0 so would you like to just uh, just distinguish industry 5.0 from industry 4.0 yeah so uh, i don't have the expertise professor so i must demo uh, i have spent a lot of time in industry 4 i don't understand fully yet the industry 5 concepts uh, so i must park it for another time so that i can do my own research before i can make an attempt at answering this okay so let me uh, give my uh, my sort of thoughts on that uh, the industry 5.0 is really you know trying to say that uh, we need to make industry 4.0 more people centric okay. and people empowered so that's what in industry 5.0 is about and there are different names again for these just as industry 4.0 also have other names such as smart manufacturing and so on uh, 
uh, and Japan, for example, calls it a society uh, 4.0 or 5.0, I think, because they sort of look at it as uh, the pre-agrarian society to agrarian society, then industrial society, information society, and so on, right? And uh, finally, uh, now uh, the the kind of society that we are looking for, where it is human-centric society. So they that's the sort of I think uh, the paradigm of thinking. Uh, I'll just move on to the next question. Uh, the, I think these questions are asked in multiple ways. You know, one. We are worried about the competition from countries that have better cost advantage and also countries that have better, uh, what I would say, knowledge advantage. Uh, and um, then, uh, you know, somebody has also asked, you know, Israel is more innovative, why can't India be and so on. So, a single question, which is that, what's the distinctive nature, apart from democratic dividend that you have already spoken about, sure. yeah. that distinguishes India from others? so that it can also have its claim on a portion of this pie. So, uh, thanks, Professor. I think that's a very interesting question. But actually, um, as an industry practitioner or as industry practitioners, um, I think you touched upon this a little bit earlier, that we should focus on delivering value. Right. The question for us is really, uh, and if you can make radiator caps, world-class radiator caps, um, you know, as part of, the TVS group, and we all know their story to quality, uh, we can do anything that we want, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this, uh, I can, for those of you who are from Bangalore, I'll relate this to a very everyday example, um, Darshanis, right? We all have had experience in eating in Darshanis in Bangalore. Today in Bangalore, it's one of the modern cities of India where you can have a meal for 100 rupees or less and feel satisfied that it's a clean, hygienic, healthy meal. Um, and Darshanis have made that happen, right? It's not like we didn't have experience of idli and dosa and vadas before Darshanis came in, but the Darshanis found a way to serve that thing in a way that made value added sense to you, that it was clean, you could stand and eat, it was not a fussy sitting down and the server comes to you and asking you for your order. You could go collect your food, eat it, have a cup of coffee and be on your way in 10 minutes or less. Now, this is value for a customer. For a customer who is in a hurry, uh, he or she just wants an office uh, meal and move on uh, from that thing, right? So in this way, there are multiple ways we can service customers across the world. Uh, there are customers who are very finicky about quality, Japanese, Germans, South Koreans, for example. Uh, there are customers who are looking up to us as Indians uh, to deliver better quality, people probably in the African continent, as an example, right? Uh, people that we can actually deliver off patent medicines, off patient uh, or healthcare services uh, in ways that they haven't thought about. I mean, medical tourism is a big thing already. Narayana Hadeyali is doing seminal work uh, for people in West Asia and uh, northern parts of Africa. People come here for getting treated for cardiovascular diseases. So it's possible for us to be global in terms of services. Um, and we have more technology at our disposal than some of these countries have, sub-Saharan sub, sub African countries have. And it, it works out a lot cheaper for them than go to a Western country. So the answer is for us to find, if we deliver value, if we find the space where India can offer unique advantages, we will win. If we try to compete with others on the parameters of cost, on the parameters of cheap, we may not win, but then that is their game, right? We shouldn't go and play their game. We should play our own game. That would be my solution. <clears throat> Professor, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that I'm going to add one point, and that is the following. And that's sort of the question of is industry 4.0 for us? Uh, I think the answer is an emphatic yes. And uh, the yes. The reason why it is an emphatic yes is that you know we need to ask this question. The, the, the moot question is the following. Can having data, can having connectivity, can having analysis of that data provide value for any of the bottlenecks, problems, opportunities <laughs> for you? And if the answer is yes, then yes, industry 4.0 is for you. And if it's not, then it is not. 
So uh, I think uh, I don't know how long more we have, but I, I we don't have a great deal of questions at this point of time. So I'll say that I would like to profusely thank you for bringing a very wide array of uh, points together. It's not easy to give a talk on Industry 4.0. And you have done a splendid job, and I'm thankful uh, to you for that. And I'll pass it on to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Amrish Chakravarti and Krish. Krish, I've known you, I think, through most of your uh, career. And what stood out today, as it has all, always, is the same level of systematic and clear thinking and uh, the enthusiasm that you bring to everything that you do. So thank you ever so much for you know, you. taking this up and thank you for being here and uh, doing this wonderful talk. Um, I, I thought the positive tone and uh, and especially the examples of the great innovations that are going on right here in India uh, uh, was really, really nice. And the question then is, how do we take advantage of all this good stuff that is happening uh, to get to that 5 trillion economy that we want to, to become? And you mentioned that the that from this 15% contribution of manufacturing that we've stagnated at for half a century to looking at moving to 25% uh, of the uh, of the gdp is not is not uh, it's not a pipe dream it is something that can be achieved um okay so just a few key takeaways from today's session uh, we looked at various stages of uh, evolution of industry and uh, the first, second, third, and then the fourth revolution, which is really industry, what we call industry 4.0 today. Uh, and, and the key thing there is the cross, cross disciplinarity of, um, of, of various areas, the physical world, the digital world, and biology. So that, that really is the heart of what has enabled industry 4.2 to become what it is. Um, and then as a bonus, we had Professor Amrish talk about what Industry 5.0 is, uh, which is really a people-centric paradigm. We looked at the building blocks of Industry 4.2, the techno technology, technology foundations. But for me, the more important thing was, I think we've kind of heard all of this, and we've, we've also heard about them, many of these things in our own webinars here in bits and pieces. But what was very nice was painting that picture of how it all falls together to become Industry 4.0. And, um, and Professor Amrish mentioned the concept of autonomy as being at the heart of all of this. Uh, the, the important thing takeaway for me again was that Industry 4.0 is not one monolithic, vague thing. Uh, but uh, when we looked at the examples, especially, I thought it became very clear that it is these little, little things that can be taken up, uh, but they do have a large impact and they would, none of them would be, would be possible if it were not for these pieces of technology that today can work together. And it's not about each of them individually, but the fact that they can come together and deliver something uh, in an integrated manner. Then we saw what India's journey in manufacturing has been. Uh, we looked at many challenges. We looked at uh, opportunities and advantages. Krish mentioned that these challenges are real and some are imaginary, but we nevertheless need to surmount them. And that, of course, gave us a list of areas that India needs to focus on. The good thing is that we as a nation have aspirations to become global leaders, self-sufficient, sustainable, etc. So that's, of course, the first step is having that aspiration. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Krish, for calling out one challenge, which is the low uh, labor participation of women. Uh, and yeah, we, we do need to do something about it. Uh, it, I, you know, from the time that I remember presenting at a CSI conference some 20 years back, I would say exactly the same today. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, another one was the industry academia collaboration. And uh, for our audience, I just want to say that's exactly why IIT ACB exists. That's exactly what we want to, uh, to do 
to enable the IITs the, and, uh, and other uh, institutes and industry to, to work together to collaborate to do something that is substantially larger than what anyone could do on their own. So please do talk to us. I've posted our email here. Please do write to us. We are happy to, to engage and collaborate. Then uh, finally, we looked at how does a company actually get going on this Industry 4.0 journey? And uh, Chris said, start with single areas. Uh, you know, things that do have an impact, but start with a single area and then the journey kind of just progresses and happens. Uh, we, we saw many examples of what is happening right here in India. And, and uh, especially, you know, the fact that we have corneal and liver tissue being printed right here in Bangalore is absolutely fascinating. And then we saw real life examples of blockchain, uh, guided vehicles, computer vision, and how they make a difference, even if that is to a, a specific area, how that really makes a difference to the, the company and obviously from there to industry as a whole. I thought the example of the oxygen lungs in blast furnaces was particularly pertinent because uh, that is an area where we are, uh, you know, human life is at risk and here's how technology can actually help. We ended the presentation with many questions and concerns, uh, such as cost efficiency, sustainability, relevance to India, the impact on labor, uh, et cetera. So many of those uh, issues. Uh, new jobs of the future, and they are going to be so different from what we can even think of today. So there's no point kind of thinking about all of that. It is going to be different, and we know that. Uh, we, we looked at the impact of all of this on society. Uh, the heartwarming story of Miti Cafe, I thought was very nice. And But what, what it brought to me is the fact that there are young Indians who are doing some phenomenal work. And uh, again, that strikes a very hopeful uh, note for a very, very exciting future for our nation. And uh, that was a nice, a nice place to end that. So thank you all very much for attending. Uh, and being so interactive and you know the, the questions are so important for us because they they are what enrich the the whole conversation and uh, professor amresh thank you very much for being here uh, we couldn't have asked for uh, anyone better to to kind of really bring this presentation uh, together and uh, krish thank you ever so much as well thank you okay. thank you all right thank thank you bye good night yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.